This is Space Time, Series 19, Episode 83, for broadcast on the 23rd of November, 2016. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audioboom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, the most powerful fast radio burst ever detected, could a hypothetical particle called an axion be the answer to dark matter? And China launches a new experimental X-ray pulsar navigation satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected the most powerful fast radio burst ever seen. Fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are mysterious powerful radio flashes lasting just milliseconds. No one knows what causes them. Consequently, their origins continue to baffle astronomers. Now, a report in the journal Science claims researchers have used one of these sudden eruptions of radio waves to study the large-scale structure of the universe. A cosmic web of empty voids surrounded by delicate filaments of galaxies and connecting nodes of galaxy clusters. The event, called FRB 150807, was the brightest and most luminous fast radio burst ever detected. One of the study's authors, Dr Ryan Shannon from the CSIRO and John Curtin University, says while the origins of fast radio bursts remain a mystery, his team were able to use the fact that they occurred billions of light years away to study the faint, diffuse material that exists between galaxies. It seems that although this matter is not normally visible to telescopes, it can be studied using fast radio bursts as the illuminating source. Nearly half of all visible matter is thought to be thinly spread throughout intergalactic space. When fast radio bursts travel through space, they pass through intergalactic material and are distorted, similar to the apparent twinkling of a star caused by its light being distorted by its atmosphere. So by observing these bursts, astronomers may be able to learn a great deal about the regions of the universe through which the burst travelled on its way to Earth. FRB 150807 appears to be only weakly distorted by the material within its host galaxy, which shows that the intergalactic medium in this direction is no more turbulent than theorists originally predicted. This is the first direct insight into turbulence within the intergalactic medium. The researchers detected FRB 150807 while they were using the CSIRO's Parkes radio telescope to monitor a nearby pulsar, a rotating neutron star emitting a beam of radio waves and other electromagnetic radiation. Shannon says that thanks to a real-time detection system developed by Swinburne University, his team found that although the FRB was millions of times further away than the pulsar, the magnetic fields in their directions appear identical. He says this consequently refutes some claims that FRB are produced in dense environments with strong magnetic fields. The results provide a measure of the magnetism in the space between galaxies, an essential step in determining how cosmic magnetic fields are produced. So far, only 18 fast radio bursts have been detected. And mysteriously, with possibly one exception, and they're not too sure about that, these FRBs only ever give out a single burst, and they're not repeated. Additionally, most FRBs have been detected with telescopes doing survey work, that is, they're observing large areas of the sky, but with poor resolution, making it difficult to pinpoint the exact location of a given burst. However, the unprecedented brightness of FRB 150807 allowed the authors to localise it much more accurately, making it the best localised FRB to date. The fact that it was observed by two detectors simultaneously allowed scientists to more accurately pinpoint where it may have originated from. These measurements narrowed down the flash to several possible sites, with the most likely being a galaxy called VHS-7. Pinpointing the locations of fast radio bursts will soon become much easier with the commissioning of the Deep Synoptic Array prototype, an array of 10 radio telescope dishes being built at Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observatory in California by NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. 
Astronomers estimate there are over 2,000 FRBs occurring in the sky every day. And one in ten of these should be every bit as bright as FRB 150807. And consequently, the Deep Synoptic Array prototype should be able to pinpoint their locations to individual galaxies. Measuring the distances to these galaxies will enable astronomers to use fast radio bursts to weigh the tenuous intergalactic material between us and them. Ryan Shannon says while the events generating fast radio bursts still remain a mystery for now, astronomers nevertheless are learning more about them and how to use them to further other astronomical endeavours. There are a new class of bright radio emission. So what we see is we see flashes of radio waves. They show the effects of travelling through large columns of ionized material. So what we see is we see these pulses and because of the way light travels or radio waves travel through ionized gas, they arrive earlier at higher frequencies and lower at later frequencies. So we know that they travel through these great columns of gas. We think that they've traveled hundreds of millions or billions of light years to get to us. What causes them is the thing that we don't know. So what we see is we see these very bright flashes of radio waves and we see the effects of the gas on them. This includes that change in the speed of light. You can also see the effect of the magnetization of the gas. So if the gas has a magnetic field in it, that will affect the way the pulse looks. And we can also see the effect of how turbulent or how clumpy the gas is. That will also change the pulses. Sort of properties. So by looking at the properties of these fast radio bursts, you can tell a lot about the intervening intergalactic material that these bursts are travelling through. That's exactly it. So even though we don't know yet what causes them, we can use them as really interesting probes of the space in between us and them. And the space is very, what I call very diffuse. There isn't a lot of material in it, but when you add it all up, you can see the fingerprint of that material on the burst itself. And the space, which you can call the intergalactic medium or the cosmic web, is very hard to study in any other way. If you're to look at it in x-rays, it's very faint, and you really can't see it in optical light. So these fast radio bursts are proving to be very valuable probes of it. The cosmic web's an amazing thing, isn't it? These are the filaments and connecting nodes, <laughs> which are made out of galaxies, basically, and, and they form the ultimate large-scale structure of the universe. Yeah, yeah basically, after the Big Bang, all the material fell onto these very large-scale structures. So we've got objects that we call filaments, where the galaxies and clusters of galaxies reside. And in between those, we have voids, where there's an absence of things. Things that we mostly see are the galaxies. And, of course, the light from the stars within those galaxies. But in between those galaxies, there's actually a tremendous amount of material. What we would like to know is sort of how that material feeds onto galaxies and what that material looks like. In fact, we think now a lot of the missing matter, and I'm talking about baryonic matter here of the universe, may be contained in that gas between the galaxies. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. So when people go around and try to make like a budget or audit how much baryonic material, of course there's dark matter and dark energy, but just the baryonic material, they find that a large fraction of that is missing. So what people think is that there's in this filamentary structure, in this cosmic web, there's ionized material, so we call ionized gas plasma, or just the intergalactic medium. And even though it's very diffuse, because the filaments and the web is just so large, that's where all this missing matter can be. Just the other day there was a story which came out about fast radio bursts looking at the possibility of a link between fast radio bursts and gamma radiation which was seen which okay. seems to possibly narrow down the likely culprit as to the progenitor which causes fast radio bursts. One of the things that came out of that study was just acknowledgement of the fact that there are probably about 2,000 of these FRBs occurring somewhere in the universe every day so there must be a lot of them out there and if there are a lot of them out there then that must for someone like you doing this work in to the cosmic web, that must yeah. give you a great chance to look in all directions to see what it's like everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. So one of the things about our burst is that it's, it's very bright and it's the brightest burst seen since the first one that was, ever, that was discovered. And what that means is that there's a population of bright bursts and these are the best ones to study the structure of the cosmic web with them. What it also means is that you don't need to have the largest telescope to see them. And an interesting thing about the way telescopes work is that you can trade off field of view, so the, the size of the patch of the sky you can look for with a sort of sensitivity or, or telescope size. So if we can look over a wider area of the sky, we should be able to see more of them. The reason why we haven't seen all these bursts is because we've only have had telescopes that look at very narrow patches of the sky. So 
one project I'm involved with is to use the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder that is being completed in Western Australia to search for these bursts. And what we'll do is we'll take the individual dishes from that telescope and point them in different directions. And we call this a fly's eye mode. And so each of them are looking at different portions of the sky. And what we'll be able to do then is survey a much larger portion of the sky. The telescope's also equipped with new technology that means that each dish can look in 36 individual directions. As a result, within the next few months, we'll have a telescope that can look over an area of the sky that's 360 times that of parks. So we should be able to detect these bright bursts at a rate 360 times faster than parks if our predictions are correct. And that will be very exciting for us to catch more of these bursts because we only have seen 18 so far. But to make these detailed studies of the structure of the cosmic web, we need many more. I believe our other telescopes are being brought in too. The Murchison Wildfield Array, which is sort of a pathfinder to the pathfinder almost. Yeah. And also, the Mal- this is a great one, the Malongolo Observatory down near Canberra. That was something that we all thought disappeared and became yeah. shake paddock, but now now it's bad. Yes, there's a big, people have realized that because of the rate of these events that telescopes that have wide fields of view should be able to see many of them. So, of course, yeah, you've got the MWA, which is operating at a lower frequency. So one of the big questions is, if you look at the wavelength of MWA, how many do you expect to see? And they've got an uh, incredibly wide field of view where they can basically see most of the sky that's up at any one time. Then Malongola, as you mentioned, you know, I think it's a 60-year-old telescope. Do yeah, you, something you know? like that. Yeah, it's, it's older than I am, telescope. I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so what you can do is you can equip the telescope with new electronic systems, so new digital systems. And when you do that, you've basically refitted the telescope with a new technology, and you can turn it into a fast radio burst hunting machine. And... One of the exciting things about Malongolo is that one of the things they're going to do is they're setting it up as a basically a complete interferometer. So what they'll be able to do is measure a precise location for these bursts. And with a precise location, you should be able to tell exactly what galaxy that FRBs are coming from. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Because one of the problems we've got with FRBs is by their very nature, they're very ephemeral. And so although you might be able to see them in radio, you've got to have other telescopes at other yeah. bands of the electromagnetic spectrum yeah. able to move there really quickly. That announcement last week about the detection of gamma ray associated with the fast radio burst, that was only made because because NASA's Swift Space Telescope just happened to be looking in that direction anyway. That that's exactly it. Uh, so the Swift Telescope has a very it also has a it's a it's a space telescope and it has a very wide field of view. So it has a detector on it that can see maybe like half the sky at any one time. Hmm. And what it can do is it, it can trace gamma rays looking at very high energy radiation and it can trace that as it goes through their detector. So then despite having a very wide field of view, they can pinpoint the locations of the burst to reasonable accuracy. You would need to have observations at many different wavelengths to be able to figure out where these bursts are coming from. Uh, the burst that we discovered was interesting because we were able to use its brightness and the fact that we were able to detect it in two of basically pixels of Parks' detection systems. So Parks has sort of a 13, what we call a 13 beam system, which means like 13 pixels. And what we saw was that the burst was detected in two of these pixels. So we could tell that it was coming from a location in between the two pixels. That allowed us to narrow the region down greatly in which we thought the burst was coming from. And when we looked in that region in optical light, we only saw three stars in our own galaxy. And we don't think FRBs, we're pretty confident FRBs don't come from stars in our own galaxy. And then beyond that, there is only six other bright galaxies, the brightest of which we refer to as VHS-7, is about a billion light years away, at least. And that's the most likely candidate at this stage? That's the most likely candidate, but we can't rule out the other candidates or a more distant, fainter galaxy. But what we're able to say is that it's coming from at least a billion billion light years from us. It's a very exciting time for FRBs. What we don't know yet is what the source source of them. The the gamma ray result, as as you said, hints that they might be coming from cosmic explosions. Yeah, yeah. But wasn't there a report last year that uh, there was one FRB which seemed to reoccur, happened more than once? So the idea of a catastrophic yeah. stellar explosion was ruled out by that, assuming that was actually yeah. an FRB, of course. Yeah, that, that's a very intriguing source. And it's been the only one that has been found to, mm. found to repeat.
And it's it's quite interesting because the one we discovered was so bright, you might expect that you'd be more likely to see repeating bursts from it. But we we searched for hundreds of hours with both Parkes and the Malongolo telescope, and we haven't seen any repeats. So are these the same types of bursts, or are they different? And when you only have 18 known sources, you kind of don't want to start dividing them up, up into different classes. But at some point, you have to... They had to do that with gamma ray bursts, whether they liked it or not, didn't they? <laughs> they yeah, they yeah, weren't all the yeah, same. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So there's going to be a meeting early next year in the United States where the FRB community is going to get together. And I think that's going to be a great, great opportunity to ensure that we're all speaking the same language when we discuss these things, because there's groups in North America who study the, re- the repeating bursts, and there's groups in here in Australia and Europe that study the non-repeating ones. So there's sort of great debate in the community about whether these bursts are coming from relatively nearby galaxies or distant galaxies, whether they're not they're caused by explosions or sort of objects like pulsars or magnetars, which you might expect to give off more than one pulse. So it's going to be a great opportunity for the communities to get together and we can really start to understand what the similarities and the differences are between these things. Yeah, one of the big ideas was this could be a type of supernova event, but then it seemed to repeat itself, which would have ruled that out. So yeah, yeah. originally, I think the idea was these are probably merging neutron stars or, or something like that, yeah. or a quake on the surface of a magnetar. Yeah. But based on what we know now, it looks more likely that they're either a supernova event or yeah. alternatively, a supermassive black hole that's having a really good feed. Yeah, that was the hypothesis put forward by the group studying the gamma ray pulsed yeah. FRB. So just to sort of full disclosure, we just recently posted a paper on the archive where we've actually been monitoring that field for the last two and a half years because I was part of the team that discovered the fast radio burst and we've been monitoring the field for two and a half years using the Australia Telescope Compact Array. And what we looked for was to see if there was any radio source that was varying or transient that was coincident with the fast radio burst. And the idea is that the Compact Array has much higher resolution. So we should be able to pinpoint the location of the burst. What we found, we found two things. One is that in the region of the sky where the SWIFT group thought the gamma ray pulse was coming from, we didn't see any radio emission. What that wow. means, what that means is that we can place limits on the size of the explosion that caused that gamma ray pulse. They had made a prediction about how bright the explosion would be in radio waves, and we didn't see anything at that level. What we did see was what we call a variable AGN. So this is a supermassive black hole that has brightened by a factor of three right after the FRB, and then over the next three months, it faded away, but it hasn't disappeared, and it's never gotten as bright again. Mm. So we could, it could be a case of us, uh, it could just be a chance coincidence, or it could be related, and we can't really disprose cons to each of those, so we're not quite sure about that source. But uh, we're able to basically place limits on the size of the explosion from the gamma ray pulse. The other thing about it is that based on the known rate of detections from that SWIFT satellite, the number of gamma ray pulses they would see is limited to about 25 per day, which is very different than the fast radio burst rate, which is 2,500 per day. So there's still some mysteries to resolve around these gamma ray pulses, but the proof is going to be when we catch more fast radio bursts and see if they have pulses or if, if they're associated with a supermassive black hole. So, you know, it's a very exciting time for fast radio burst searches. And with each result, you invariably have more questions raised than answers you get. But I think within the next year, we're going to have a much better idea of at least where the FRBs are coming from and what type of source they're associated with. That's Dr. Ryan Shannon from the CSIRO and Curtin University. A hypothetical elementary particle called an axion could be the mysterious dark matter particle which scientists have been searching for for decades. New supercomputer modelling reported in the journal Nature has now pinned down the likely mass of the axion particle, if it exists, finding that it's within the same range as the hypothetical cold dark matter particle. Dark matter is a mysterious invisible substance thought to make up some 85% of all the material in the universe. Yet despite spending decades searching for a dark matter particle, scientists have never even seen dark matter. In fact, they only know it exists because they can see its gravitational influence on ordinary matter around it, such as its ability to hold galaxies together. Because scientists have no real idea what dark matter is, they've come up with all sorts of ideas about its likely makeup. It could be made up of comparatively few but very heavy particles, or a large number of relatively light ones. 
direct searches for heavy dark matter candidates using large detectors in underground laboratories and indirect searches for them using large particle accelerators such as CERN and the Large Hadron Collider are still going on. But none have turned up any candidate dark matter particles so far. The best they can say is that they've ruled out some candidates, thereby narrowing the field of where the particle is likely to be hiding. Right now, there are a number of physical considerations which makes extremely low-mass particles such as the hypothetical axion very promising candidates. Axions were first postulated in 1977 to solve the strong charge parity or CP problem in quantum chromodynamics. CP symmetry states that the laws of physics should be the same if a particle was interchanged with its antimatter counterpart and then left and right were swapped. In theoretical physics, quantum chromodynamics is a type of quantum field theory covering the strong nuclear force interactions between quarks and gluons, which make up the particles called hadrons, things like the protons and neutrons you find in the nucleus of atoms. Theoretical considerations indicate that there are so-called topological quantum fluctuations in quantum chromodynamics, which ought to result in an observable violation of time reversal symmetry, allowing processes to differ depending on whether time is running forwards or backwards. However, the thing is, no experiment has so far managed to demonstrate this effect. The extension to quantum chromodynamics restores the invariance of time reversals. But at the same time, it predicts the existence of a very weakly interacting particle, this hypothetical axion, whose properties, in particular its mass, would depend on the strength of the topological quantum fluctuations. The theory is an important part of the standard model of particle physics in which the strong nuclear force is one of the four fundamental forces in nature, alongside gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for radioactivity. Now physicists with the German electron synchrotron in Hamburg have determined that if the axion does in fact exist, it probably has a mass somewhere between 50 and 150 microelectron volts, which is about 10 billion times less massive than an electron. Based on these calculations, if axions were to make up the bulk of dark matter, there would probably be something like 10 million axions in every cubic centimetre of space. However, scientists believe that dark matter isn't spread out evenly across the universe, but rather it's clumped together to form the cosmic framework of galaxies. So, the clumping nature of dark matter probably means that our local region of the Milky Way galaxy probably contains more like a trillion axions per cubic centimetre. Now all we need to do is find them. China has carried out the second launch of its Long March 11 rocket, taking a new experimental X-ray pulsar navigation satellite into orbit. The Long March 11 was launched from the Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center in Inner Mongolia. The primary payload for the mission was Beijing's new X-ray pulsar navigation satellite XPNAV-1. The 240-kilogram spacecraft is part of a 10-year program to test a new autonomous deep space navigation system. It uses millisecond X-ray pulses from 26 nearby neutron stars to create a navigational database to help determine a spacecraft's position. Also aboard the flight were three Lishui-1 remote sensing satellites and the 8kg Zhejiazhang-1 6-unit CubeSat, which was placed into an 800km high orbit to test new imaging stabilisation systems. First launched back in September 2015, the 21-metre-tall Long March 11 is designed as a quick-response four-stage solid-fueled rocket which can be stored for long periods of time before use. It's designed to lift payloads of up to 350 kilograms into 700 km high orbits. Meanwhile, people are still trying to determine the origins of a strange 3.7-metre-long cylindrical object which fell onto the ground near a jade mine close to the village of Lone King in a remote mountainous region of Myanmar. At first glance, people thought the object may have dropped from a passing aircraft. However, government officials believe the object's more likely to be a rocket booster than part of a commercial aircraft, with growing speculation, partly based on timing, that it was probably part of the Long March 11 launch vehicle. Meanwhile, China has also launched a Long March 2D rocket carrying what they claim is the first of a new constellation of weather satellites. 
The Yunhai 1, which means Cloud Sea in Chinese, was lifted into a 750 kilometre high polar orbit from the Jiaquan Satellite Launch Centre in northwestern China's Gobi Desert just days after the Long March 11 launch. Interestingly, Beijing's keeping quiet about the new spacecraft. They claim it's a weather satellite designed to collect data on atmospheric and marine environments. However, they admit it will also be used for observations of the space environment as well as disaster prevention and mitigation and for scientific experiments. The disaster prevention and mitigation angle clearly points to an Earth observation capability. Add to that its placement into a low Earth polar orbit, which is highly unusual for meteorological satellites. The Long March 2D is a 41 metre long two-stage rocket capable of lifting about 1.3 tonnes into low Earth orbit. Both stages use nitrogen tetroxide and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine propellants. The first stage is equipped with a YF-21C engine burning for 170 seconds, while the upper stage uses a YF-24C cluster engine. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Spacetime as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Spacetime with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Just search for Spacetime with Stuart Gary.